Um, how's it, guys? I'm just sitting here in uh, SUP Music Room with my friend uh, Gorksy from SA Backline. Uh, we've got a couple of cameras up, like usual. Uh, we're just going to be relaxed today, just chat about a couple of things. Um, first of all, thank you for coming through, well, giving us your absolute, time. Absolute pleasure, a much-needed thing, I think. Yeah, I mean, for, from us, we've, we've been doing a whole bunch of stuff and, and um, some good conversations with musicians, with technical guys. Uh, obviously, my perspective is staying technical from the sound side. Yeah. Um, and we try and... But it's, it's a bit wider than that because what we've realized is when we talk about things like communication, um, I mean, your net can go so wide. Uh, sure. One of the things that came up, for example, is riders. You know, we, we receive riders from bands, but then from sound guy's perspective, you read a band's rider and you think, oh my goodness, you can already see by the rider how good the gig's going to be based on the lack of information and that kind of yeah, stuff. So yeah. uh, we'll get to all that kind of stuff. Uh, but first of all, just, I mean, we've been, you probably won't remember this. I remember the first gig we worked together on. The first gig we worked together on? The first gig that I was actually working on. The, only, the earliest one I remember was at His People's in Cape Town. And no, I'm going way back still. <laughs> Before that. <laughs> so it was 1990 yeah. when Carmen was here and he brought Wild Willie with him with the organ. My word. And that was at Wanderers Stadium. I don't even remember that. <laughs> It was Carmen, he had like a solo act with tracks yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And uh, he had, what, what his name was Wild Willie. He was playing the organ in the background. Yeah. And he supplied the organ for that. Oh, wow. That was. I've, yeah. I've, we've been going that long. Yeah, and then after that, obviously, <laughs> I mean, I, I started doing gigs uh, and stuff, 94, 95 with Satellite Sound back then. You know, actually, you're right, you yeah. know, because and we then, had already known each other well when, when yeah, I when got that to came these around. We, we've got yeah. basically got to know each other through Rayma, through the church. Yes. Uh, Clive Goodwill. That's right. One of your old right. friend well, bandmates. Bandmate, yeah. Yeah, because he was, he was a <laughs> piano player organist there. That's Crichton Goodwill's dad. Exactly. Um, exactly. So just, but before we get into that, I would, I would like you to share a little bit of your back end, because obviously everybody knows they say backline and Gorksy, but yeah. where did Gorksy start? How did you uh, get okay. into well, backline? Yeah, I, I, mean, I was a muser. I was a bass player. Ah, I did okay, you know. Um, and the last gig I did was a gig with with PJ Powers, and I was with her for a while. You know, she did the um, the uh, what's that woman from the sixties? She was a singer, and she was uh, you know, and they, she had developed a show around her. And I was on in that show, and then that progressed to other gigs, and we did some gigs in Africa and so on. Okay. And what happened there was I, we were doing a gig at the at the Union Buildings, and those days there wasn't a backline. Okay, it was PA Sound, who I think were the band or company at that yeah. time, and all they had was a drum kit with skins of about ten years old, and when those skins broke, they put um, masking tape over it. Mm. You know, and the bass amp was a Trace Elliott bass amp, and it was totally trash. Speakers were not working properly, and I used to moan. And my old friend John Mack was doing monitors at the time. And I started shout, shooting my mouth off, you know, how can we play with this? And, uh, and he said, shut up, Gorksy. Why don't you just start a backline company? And it was a joke. Yeah. And that was it. And I thought about it, you know. And after having gone overseas and tried to, and tried to crack it, you know, I got into a good band at that time. But when we, when we started touring, I had to give the, the tour manager my passport, which was a South African passport. Mm. No way. No way. That was the end of my career in, in, in Europe. So I came back and then I got into the PJ Powers and blah, blah, blah. And then I thought about it and I started, I said, okay, cool. I'm going to give it a go. You know? When was that? And that was around about, God, what's 20, 25 years ago. No, it must be more than that. 25 years, only 95. Yeah, I started around 94, 94, 95, the backline company. Okay. And, uh, you know, and with that, uh, I, you know, every gig I did, I bought a piece of gear because I didn't have gear. Mm. And every gig, and to this day, 90% of the gigs you do, you buy a piece of gear because gear and the, changes. And the reason for that is just technology changing. Technology the... changes. I mean, take the Motif keyboard, all right? The Motif was the first model. Then the ES was the second model. Mm. Then the XS was the next model. Then the XF. 
and none of them speak to each other. The uh, patches don't translate. Yeah, you know, they don't read. You put a memory stick, it doesn't read. And being a backline company and being a proper backline company, we have about 25 motifs. Sure. Of all the different... Of all the different ones, because I would need to have at least two eights, at least two or three sevens, and a couple of sixes of each model, mm. you know? Um, and, th and that's how it works. Do you, do you, have you ever bought... Well, I mean, basically, you just answered the question, but you, you pretty much, you only buy when it's on a rider. I, what I do, yes, originally what I would do, if I saw something on a rider, I went and bought it. Okay, I learned a little bit of an expensive lesson, but what I found after that is when it appears on a few riders, mm. then buy it. So, but now, wh how do you handle that transition? When you get a, because what happens with the typical production company, you know, because there are a couple that have bought mm -hmm. backline. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is a conversation that's come up with a couple of the musos as well. Sure. I go and buy a kit, bass amp or two, guitar amp or two, and keyboard in 2018. Sure. In 2019, that keyboard especially is no longer on the riders. Correct. But that's what I've but invested up to 100,000 Rand in a couple yeah. of keyboards. Yeah. So when a, when a rider comes through, what tends to happen would be phone up, Listen, this is what we have. Would you be willing to play on this? And if it's decent, often you do get a, a um, little bit of leeway, depending on what the gig is. You know, festivals and stuff, obviously, we get away with yeah. a lot. And also, it depends the, on the muser, actually. Yeah, yeah, depends on the muser. depends on what he wants to do. I know that uh, if you speak to guys like Lebo now in, in the gospel scene, or even Brendan Ross, when he travels right. Blue and Blue, yeah. he's by nature, a prepared guy. So he prepares his patches, prepares all his stuff. So when he puts a keyboard on a rider, it's not just, oh, that'll be nice to have. It's part of who he is Correct. in terms of translating, Correct. you know, his performance. You know, if he gets there and it's not what he's asked for, then he's got to spend time recreating stuff. If there was a phone call saying, listen, we can't get one for this gig, he comes prepared in the mindset at least. But it's communication. Yeah. We spoke about that last week a lot where it's, you have to have the communication. So Sure. Well, I mean, it's, if you, I mean, you said it earlier. I mean, you get some riders which are not riders. It's, it's just a, an equipment list of mm. sort. Yeah. But if you take the, what, the, what you, we're talking about now and you take it to the nth degree, um, the U.S. is the biggest example of that, okay, is I would say that 99% of the gigs that I do which have American keyboard players, they do not use stock sounds at all. Yeah. The patches and they stuff. Come, yeah, they come with their sticks and they load their sounds. Okay? As, and in conversation with a couple of guys, in, in that area, in the US and so on, it's actually frowned upon. If you're a keyboard player that, say, orders an XF8 Yamaha and just uses the stock sounds, it's actually frowned upon. It's mm. like, what? Because you've not done your own I mean, where's, this, where's the creativity here? It's that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, or like in your industry, mm. when you do a festival, and a, a pro we'll say a, a proper festival, the engineer before you will flatten the desk before you get there. Yeah. You know, and the probable well, I mean, reason is, you know, he doesn't want you to use his sounds. Well, I mean, I've had a conversation about that, me and Audrey and I think and Morris as well, where, yeah. you know, when if I've done a mix on a console and another guy says, can I use your mix? I can say yes, but everything changes except the mix. So it's actually useless. You actually shoot yourself in the foot. You're better off just starting well, from scratch precisely. because the band changes. Precisely. Even if it's the same kit, the drummer dynamic, everything no, changes. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Um, and on keyboards, I know a lot of the guys save their patches on your keyboards, and you tend to not. I mean, you upgrade when they need upgrade. We uh, upgrade, and when we service the keyboards, what we do is we go back to factory sets, okay. factory resets, Which then so deletes, whatever's there. Um, yeah. If the guys do use their own sounds, and they got it on a stick, well, then it's fine. Then it's fine. Right? I would encourage all keyboard players to Harry, get yeah. into that idea, you yeah. know. And, and talking about riders, I think a, a proper rider, in inverted commas, would be a rider that has a wish list of gear and an alternative or two to the gear. So, you know, uh, so, uh, so. Let me just come to this point now. So you've worked with internationals, yeah, and you, you've stated, and they get very. I've seen international writers, and I've worked with them, and they yeah. get very specific. Yes, and you know, even to the 
the type of throne on the drum kit. Oh yeah, oh you for know, sure. Four-legged, yeah, yeah. three-legged, adjustable, no everything. Question. And it, and if it's not right, it's a big problem because I mean that's you know if a guy's touring and he's doing two, three hundred shows a year, you know he doesn't want to readjust and re adapt every single time he wants sure. to walk in sit down play next sure. and he wants it to sound the way it sh exactly. the way he hears it because yeah. if he's doing 10 shows already that's what he wants to hear yeah so even symbols you know? i mean on yeah. drummers, you know sizes sure. types all that kind of stuff for sure for um, sure skins yeah um, the thing is you know the problem about that is is once you've been exposed and doing, doing let's see what i do okay because i would say that the backline company is that interface between technical which would be the mixer, the, the front of the house, the, all the, the monitors and everything, the and now. the musician. Yes. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, those companies that buy some gear, it's fine that they buy gear because they're, they're in it for money and they want to make money and it's easier. Mm. But I think it's a misnomer to say we were backline. We do backline. We have some backline would be right because, you know, for, from my experience, the interaction with the musician mm. Because my job as a backline person or a tech at the time, okay, is to give the, the, the musician the facility to be inspired because you, it's a creative thing. Yeah. So you cannot be creative if your attention is stuck on the sound of this thing which is wrong yeah, and you're or like, you're not happy with. It, just, it becomes a distraction. You know, so the techie's job really is to actually service the musician to the point where he can create. Yeah. I love the way you said that because, I mean, even in using a lot of technology from a sound perspective these days, a lot of guys, you know, I set up, for example, control switches and function switches yeah. that yeah. do a lot of stuff. And we go, so you're not actually mixing anymore. I said, no, well, I've set up all that so that I can get creative. Exactly. If I'm stuck in doing 20 things and, you know, I can only do so much at one time. So I'm using technology to free me up to get creative, and if you if you haven't planned correctly, if I haven't communicated correctly, then even with the technology in front of me, I can still fall over because I'm distracted. Totally. So totally. having a communication plan, having the right techs on the stage, you know, because yeah. backline yeah. techs are not just another sound guy that's no. got nothing to do. You know, okay, sure. well, your your drums. Yeah. You know, if you're a drum tech, you should be able to play, tune, set up. Absolutely. You know, and have a, a, an educated interaction with the drummer, not just yeah. stand there and wait for yeah. him. Uh, you, yeah, a good interpretation. You, you know, I mean, if he exactly. goes, whatever the signal is, as most drummers would have that kind of signal, like yeah. any muso would go <laughs> up or down or, you know what yeah. I'm saying, in the mix. And the, that's important. Yeah. That's so important. And, and, you know? and what, what, I've, what I've found, which is a bit of a, I mean, we've all had this, especially locally, and I say that locally in South Africa, because what happens is, Guys don't often get opportunities to have to send a rider, number one. Yeah. You know, so if you get booked by a band and they say, Well, what would you like? Or what's your rider? Then guys sort of tend to like, hmm, go on the internet, what's the latest, what's the greatest, put that on my rider. So you don't own it, but now you've got an opportunity to be on stage. And if it's realistic to the gig, yeah. I get it. Yeah. But we, yeah. we get this with wannabe DJs a lot where we've got to rent in the top of the range Panasonic uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Pioneer. I know you, exactly. Kit, and then the guy doesn't know how it works. Exactly. You know, and, exactly. and we've had my techs show the DJ that's yep. requested the gear yep. how it works. Yep. You know, and, and I've seen that with Backline as well. A guy asks for a new montage, for example, yep. and then sits behind it, and it takes him, he doesn't, he's not played it before, he doesn't know how it works. You know? Especially guys that have played the motifs before, and then the, because there's no more motif. Yeah. Okay, now there's the, the montage. So, as guys have done it in the past, it's like there the, was the ES model and then the XS model comes out. So IE musician would say, okay, I want the XS. Because it's the But he doesn't know the, the, the difference between the two, you know, yeah. and, the, and the jump from, the, from the, the motif to the montage is, it's a different keyboard. Well, they, that's a new generation it's of a, keyboards. It, it, it's not similar. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, yeah. And that's where the well, thing I, breaks I've down. I've realized over the years, if you're a core guy and a Roland guy and a Yamaha guy, the, the interfaces are so different. They are. You know, so they are. core guys like core because it's familiar ground. So even yep. little changes, you find yep. your way quicker. Yep. And then I give you a Roland and you're like, you probably know what you want, but the navigation of this of the GUI yep. and all that is quite And they're quite equal. Tricky. They're they're seriously equal in terms of what they're capable of doing. 
Exactly. You know what I'm saying? I mean, let's let's talk about action. And guys will ask for weighted and unweighted. What is the 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 when you what a true weighted keyboard? You know, a true weighted keyboard would be a piano. Correct. And the, the weighted comes from the piano. Okay. From the and actual from the, from the actual note action. of the piano. Yeah, yes. the weight. Okay. So on an 88, which is generally a weighted synthesizer, okay, they try and and tr try and duplicate that feel. Yes. Okay. So it's the pressure, but it's there's the mechanism pressure. to the, have like the, bounce yeah, it's, action. Yeah, it's how, how hard it is to push, I suppose. Yes. If you really break it down, as opposed to the to the synth keys, which are the soft keys, and the the advantage for the soft keys is that you can move faster, unless you're a concert pianist. Yeah. <laughs> but you can do those drifts and you can do those things easily. Yes. Okay. But and that's the difference. I mean, a, a guy who's playing synth wouldn't be able to perform. On, an, on a weighted keyboard. Mm. So, but a, a, a guy that's a weighted, weighted keyboard, for I know, for example, I know a couple of pianists slash keyboardists who, if you give them a motif or a Korg option, they would choose the motif and they'd say the action is better. Yes, there is a difference because each manufacturer does it differently. They, they, they're trying to achieve they don't the, copy the sensation. Each other. Yeah. Do, they, um, do they like... Sample them on a Steinway or a Yamaha. Or oh, I don't know. That would be research and discovery. But I mean, the guys, the the for me, the the, the company that is way ahead of that is Nord. Okay. And Nord have been going since the sixties. Mm. Okay, they started off out there. A lot of guys think Nord is only like in the last. No, Nord years. is it's Nord is is quite a quite a company. It's for my taste. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they continuously research, and they continuously think. I mean, you want a Hammond sound? The, the C2D is the closest you get to a Hammond mm. in any synth format, yeah. any digital We're going to do that tomorrow, just by the way, for those who are watching this tonight. Um, we've got Lungelo coming in tomorrow, and Gorks, he's actually just delivered a, a, a Hammond for us, and he's going to demonstrate the, the difference Hammond between itself, the, the two, difference yeah. on the sliders and all that. And we, I'm going to do a little technical on the miking of it, because we obviously do a lot of live recordings. So. And that, that's a key. I mean, the, the, the Hammond system, conjunction with the Leslie and all that is a... Cannot is a be duplicated. It's very difficult <laughs> it's to duplicate, yeah. That's, I'm, gonna, I'm doing a project at, in my warehouse. Currently, I'm fixing up my Rhodes pianos. So I've mm. got f five of them in pieces. <laughs> and I'm just waiting for some stuff from the US, and they're going to be so perfect when awesome. they're finished, man. Well, you, you just said it now, your warehouse. Mm. W tell people what is in your warehouse at SA Backline. Oh my word! Is it a double uh, garage? It's no. It's a little bigger than that. <laughs> I'd say. I'll, maybe if I talk in terms of relative amounts of gear, mm. in terms of drum kits, there are about thirty-five drum kits on and, shelves. And, and define a drum kit. Well, the drum do you, kit. For, do you buy a drum kit in its sort of full flexible manner? So you buy mostly. It, if if the kit is manufactured with an eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, do you buy the whole kit? Yeah. So that the drummer can then choose what, which ones he wants to use. What I would do is, um, not all the kits have that, because not all of the kits, you can get all that yes. stuff. But the ideal world is to have the kit with, with all the sizes. As that a would be your first. So you yeah. would have an 8-inch rack tom, 10, 12, 13, 14. Okay? Mm. Then you would have 14, 15, 16, 18 floors. Okay. Okay. The odd numbers are not really relative anymore unless you're playing rock and roll. Okay. Okay. So you have a fusion kit, which is generally 10, 12, 14, with a 20 or 22 kick drum. Okay. Then you get the rock kit, which is a 12, 13, 16. That's the, the basic format for manufacturers. Yes. Okay. What we do is if, when we buy a kit, we will buy extra, we'll buy definitely an 8 inch. We'll definitely buy an 18 inch, okay? And then the kick drums, I like to have at least an 18, a 20, and a 22. For a particular kit? For, a, for each, say, like take a Yamaha Maple Custom, mm. okay? We have, for, for the one I'm thinking of, is an 8, 10, 12, 13, 14, 16, 18. 18 inch kick drum, 20 inch kick drum, 22 inch kick drum, 24 inch kick drum. Sure. So it's a, it's, a, it's, it's the whole one kit. or two snares, obviously. Snares is a different game altogether. You know, they you don't always get a snare in the finish of the kit you make of your bar that you buy. Okay. 
you know. Yeah, you'd get t uh, a, so let's say 10, 12, 14, 16 with a 14 snare. Which okay, like that would stock, be the standard yeah. stock snare, yeah. right? Because it, it's um, not a shell design in that. Yeah, kit. you get like, I mean, they'll make a basic, like this kit. This kit should have a, 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 a yes. that same color, snare. which would be a standard one. Yeah. Or a DW broken glass will have a 14 inch DW broken glass snare. Mm. But it's not really the snare, you know. This, I mean, guys like Musos, snare they're very personal. specific. I mean, we have, I mean, we have 35 drum kits, say, okay, but we have like 80 snare drums. Sure. Okay, because the depth, the width, the finish, you know, it's. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, a Pearl Masters, a Pearl reference snare. It's got about 13 ply. Sure. Well, that's, it's, that's, uh, I'm sure it'll break the snare stand before <laughs> before the muso can break the snare. Yeah. You know. Um, so that's the, the one model. You know. Then you get um, I don't know spawn. You know. Mm. Or, or crush. It's a, it's a very thin shell. Yeah, with the wooden rims. And yeah. You know, and that it that shows plays the dynamic. You know, of the of the thing. Yeah. You know. So while we're talking about drum kits, there's this whole thing about you know the guys that are endorsed. Right. Whether it be with Yamaha, yeah. DW, yeah. Sonor, Pearl. Yeah. When you get a rider from one of those guys and he asks for the spec of what his endorse endorsement is. Yes. Can yeah. you fill that? Uh, gen generally, yeah. If you're if you if you're worth your salt as a as a as a company, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean uh, if when we work, let's say, uh, and it's a, a DW endorsement. Well, firstly, we don't charge for the kit, okay? okay? You know, because we get we get a good price or a good deal with with the company. So some companies they will send us a kit as a, so as, as an can... endorsement kit, mm. okay? But generally they don't, okay? It depends and, on the market. Obviously. Well, it depends on, on where we are. You know, in South Africa we are not we are not on the world uh, what the world route, if you like. Yeah, you know, we're a, we're a detour. You know, and uh, I mean, we we still got a ways to go. Mm. You know, I mean, John Henry's in England; they're a backline company, tech company, to such an extent where they are being allowed to endorse on behalf of companies. Oh wow! So they will come across a drummer, and they will go, "Hey, Mr. Drummer, you you're a hot drummer. I think you you're going to go places." Blah 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 blah. We at John Henry's are going to endorse you with a, a pearl drum kit, a pearl endorsement, okay? Mm. And then John Henry's take care of it with pearl. And pearl will recognize it. And that. pearl will recognize it yeah. on their recommendation. Okay. So I would love to get to that point, you know, because I so, think endorsements in South Africa are a little, a little odd, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's... It's, it's a sort of I not mean, for the right I'm, reason. I'm on the receiving side where yeah. someone will just say... How do you check that? I mean, someone says, I'm endorsed. I have to play a montage. Oh, look, no. I mean, you, if you email the, email the, the manufacturer, they'll, they'll know. Mm. The artist relations, they'll, they, that's all recorded. Okay. You know? But a proper endorsement is, should be the value to the, to the product. Correct. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like DW. You don't get an endorsement easily with DW. Okay? And even if you do, you will either get only a hardware endorsement or you'll get a shell endorsement. Okay. Okay. And only the real big boys get the whole deal. The full kit. You know? And when you are endorsed by DW and f you have a full endorsement, when they put, a, put out a line of drum kits, they will send you one. That's yeah. a proper endorsement. Yes. But what's the exchange? Exchange is you've got to appear for them. You've got to do workshops for them. You've got to product, you know, push the product. You've mm. got to wear the, 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 the clothes. The you've got yeah. all that stuff, you yeah. know? You've got to talk about it. Correct. That's what that's the exchange, you know. Yeah. No, but I mean it's it's only fair, and, and and I think it's, but it's and it's also it's when you get there. I mean, I remember re reading the story on um, Kira Jimbo. Yeah. You know, started playing drums at the age of seventeen only. Yeah. And at twenty one, was full Yamaha endorsed, and he was I think it was the first Yamaha endorsed drummer. Could have been because it was. We're we talking now, nineteen seventy-one, I think. Oh no, he would. He would have been. Yeah, he and would I mean, have Cassiope been around the there. Yeah, yeah, endorsed. and also being being Asian. So yes, he, yeah. He would have, I mean, yeah. and, and I've I've been to his workshops. Like, you know, yeah, some of these guys are insane. Yeah, it's you know? crazy. Um, 
But I mean, backline, and, and I think you said it right, where it's the service, you know, you have to have the right attitude. And, and that's something we've spoken about from the sound side as well. You have, you've got to understand your place. You've got to understand where you are in the structure on a stage. You know, it's not about <laughs> us. If you take offense, your mindset is wrong. Totally, totally. Because if a drummer lashes out at a monitor guy or at a sound guy that he doesn't know, He's not attacking you personally. He's attacking the situation. Correct. Because he's under stress to perform. So if there's a drum tech there and he gets the rough edge of a drummer, the drummer doesn't know you, but the writer was sent through all that. You need to deliver. Exactly. And you can, you can, still, you can change that guy's day by smiling and actually just do your job. Totally. Totally you know? right. And, totally um, right. The, the, the thing that, that got me, and I've seen this with bands that I've traveled with, where you phone ahead. And you've sent the rider, you know, with, and it's full technical. And they say, no, no, we've got everything covered. Don't worry. Then you get there and everything's there, but it's not what you asked for. You know, you that know, is and then the attitude is, they'll be fine. When they get here, we'll talk to, they'll be fine. That is such, such a big problem. And it's a very, it's a problem really specific to South Africa or mm. Africa. Okay. Yeah. Because we haven't gotten to that point of, of the real interpretation between technical and as, as a service. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, it's like you, you mentioned earlier. If the drummer is, is, shoots, shoots off at, at, at the techie or at the monitor guy, mm. the, for me, the only reason he's doing that is because it's not what he wants. So, so the monitor guy, okay, is not either delivering or the tech guy is not, not delivering because the service, again, is to... To, to service to a degree whereby he can be relaxed and be creative. Correct. And it's like you said, if the if this if this drum bass drum sticks, sticks and and you go well, that's all we have, and that's the end of it. That's not doesn't yeah. cut it, you know. I mean, I was fortunate enough that I started. I did monitors for Mango Groove. That's when I first started working with Neil Etridge. Yeah. Um, Ninety six, I think, their ten year anniversary tour. Sure. Ninety six, ninety seven. Mm -hmm. um, and I got and we were a technical provider. Uh, Kevin Manners is front of house. Oh, okay, um, Margaret. Remember Kevin? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, I started doing monitors for them. I met John Layden, obviously, and the guys. Yeah. And they came to they came and checked us out at a gig we were doing at the Dome for right. T D Jakes, uh, okay. American act. Okay, yeah. Uh, you were there. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's when the Dome still had the rock feature on the That's side it. and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And. Um, I remember I was busy doing the tech there when John Layden walked in. I don't know who this guy was. You know, you make a group, but you don't expect. You know. Sure. And he's climbing my tower. I'm like, what's this guy doing? And I figured out who it was. And then we did the tour, and then I traveled with him. I got, and I remember that we were supplying backline as well. We were traveling with backline right. for that tour. Otto Vanenberg with um, Art of Light. Yes, you know, yes, he's, yes. He's now at, at um, Into Structures. And um, I got to the point where Neil would walk in because we, we did a, we did two weeks. We did 11 shows right on top of each other in, in one stint. I mean, we did right. some th job, uh, Pretoria Theatre and all yeah. that, a couple yeah. of shows. And then, then we went on tour and we would get to a venue at about 10 o'clock. Band would walk in at 2. We'd do the show the night and then next venue. And then yeah. it would go like yeah. that. And Neil would walk in eventually and sit down and go, maybe just adjust the ride. you know? Because I, I took pride That's in right. setting, That's setting exactly up it. the kit. And, you know, and even today now with my guys, we did, with Blue and Boo, we got used to the guys. And you've got to know, you, you're never going to get it perfect. You don't have the limbs of the person and all that. But you can pay attention to a drummer if you work with him enough. No where doubt. you can get very close to him sitting down and just reaching for a couple of things. You know what? You know, and then. This instrument <sighs> is unbelievable. Pictures. Yeah. I mean, in the old days before this, what I would have, I would have different color markers, uh, like Shoppies. Yeah. I'd have red, green, black. Yeah, yeah. And on the stands, if you had a b different bands on a set, you would on the on the stands you would draw circles, and it'll wash off after quite totally, easily. Totally, But you can adjust to green, you can adjust to red, you can adjust, and it's, it's you know, it's things that lo local. You know, these days, guys don't do it anymore. You know how many times I've been lying down and crawling around under a drum kit, marking, Stick, marking the foot carpet, pieces and you know, carpets and stuff. Carpet, yeah. and then you go, okay, these three legs is the hi hat. <laughs> You know, yeah. But that is so. It's so nice. Yeah. These yeah. days now, when we do setups, um, I get my text to you know if I've done mic positions on a kit, especially with DVD recordings, and we're going to do like two days of rehearsals and mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Take pictures of the snare positions and all that, because the drummer is going to settle 
and he's going to move the snare drum and all that. And they just check the picture and put my mics back where yep. I want them yep. and all that kind of yep. stuff. Uh, but it's, it's just being in that moment. Well, being you know, aware. It is. it's like being a caddy, actually, a, a golf caddy. Yeah, you, know? you get to know what's Because these ones. guys go and they, they walk the course and they make markings. Well, I mean, if you're going to tour with somebody or if you're going to do more than a, one gig, mm. okay, um, and it's something I pride in my company because we started this way early. First band that comes, international, first day, they can have texts or they don't have texts. It doesn't matter to us because we will check everything out, you know. And when they've done their sound check and they go away, and my guys will come out and they'll measure the heights of all the, the drums, okay. They'll take down the settings on the, on the amps and so on, all yeah. right. And because they never, they for the setup in the next venue. Yes. So some guys say leave everything down and their techs will come and have to do their job. Okay. But generally they don't. Mm. So what we will do is we will get to the gig at nine in the morning. The truck is offloaded and we set up the gear. Okay. Yeah. And the really nice thing is when you get their techs come to you and say, wow, you've really made my job easy today. Really dig it. And the gear is nice the, and everything. You remember the Four Double Six Six Four? Ellis yep. Park. Yeah. With the 32 drum kits, I think it was. Yeah, we, I mean, yeah, the, yeah. And we had a whole marquee and we had them. Uh, Brit, Brit Rowe was out. They did all the miking. Brit Rowe did the all, the, all the stuff, yeah. And I mean, I was watching. We were doing the broadcast, yeah. but I would spend time and I was watching these guys, their communication style, their yeah. crew planning, their strategies. And, you know, with the swiveling stage that we had, I think in that whole thing, there was probably about two or three guitar amps and one or two keyboards that got used twice. Yeah. Everything else yeah. was a one sort. Well, my, my, our pride and joy was, is, the, is the 2010 World Cup. Mm. That was, that was I, yeah. think, I think, 29 bands. The okay. kickoff. Yeah, yeah, the kickoff concert. And do you know that not one cable was, was used for anything other than its what first, it was. first so There was no repatching. You know, we would yeah. do the sound checks. The sound checks were like two days long. No, uh, we were there. Because uh, we did the broadcast for that. Oh, well, then it was... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we had the two studios. We were up and down. And you had the two stage A and B. Yeah. Um, and, and, a and, the, and the B stage was actually more just lo more, more local More kind local, of stuff. but Alicia Keys went there and the Politons yeah, were there. There yeah. was some, there were, there yeah. some nice no, big stuff. No, it was stuff. good. It was very it was good. Great. And then... Uh, but, I mean, we went from Black Eyed Peas to Shikana to Alicia Keys. To, and Shakira, I think you had your C7 the, there as well for John Legend. Well, let me say, we had... What uh, the procedure was this: We come in, we say, "Okay, that band Shakira is doing a sound check." We set up the thing, we take the time, they put everything put to be placed, everything on a riser, and everything fantastic. Okay, mm. they would do the sound check. Okay, a tarpaulin would be thrown over that gear, and it would be go and be stored. But yeah. the, but the nice thing about that is, the first band sound check lost. Yes. So they had it actually in a running order so that, that the next yeah. band, you just move the gear in. Go to the right. Okay. And the disc comes out and, and it gets struck you and it does it everything. And pack it away. And that was it. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I, pride my, I think I know my industry pretty well. Mm. Okay. But I have never experienced four to five minute changeovers. Like that. I mean, no, that was from the band going, Jung, last chord, thank you, bye, they leave the stage. From that moment, five minutes, the next band is playing. Mm. No, I remember I've never that. seen that. I, I mean, mean we, we, we ran, we, it was so quick, we ran two studios, we built two studios backstage. Um, and um, Toby Ellington was there from the, from the, um, from the UK, yeah. uh, the music group, uh, at, oh, not the music group, the control room, which was managing the production. The office is just next to us. Right. They'd booked him to do all the broadcast. Yeah. And then at some point, because I was, I was helping him, I would set up and then he would mix and then I would set up and he would mix. And yeah. we yeah. got to the point where it was so quick that he's like, okay, you do that one, I do this one. And we just split. <laughs> and he stayed where he was. <laughs> I stayed where I was. Because know? it wasn't time. So I, I ended up doing stage B. He was doing stage A. We sent it through and worked like a bomb, you know. It's fantastic. I remember the funniest they're... thing was because Alicia Keys finished her set, yeah. kept singing her song. And um, what's their name? Uh, it's a rock band from Soweto, young guys. Um, I can't remember their name now. Mm -hmm. But that she walked and sang a song with them. So she walked from stage A 
oh, two right. stage okay. B. Oh yes, yes. And we had her road manager running delay because he was he, he'd had his finger on on the effects on her vocal <laughs> yeah. on the console, but now she's walking to the other stage. So he was like, and then he had to run out, run to me. There's the delay. Keep okay. going, and we actually, me and Toby, planned it so that because it's a live broadcast, of course. So we had no, of course, there's no. We actually picked a vocal line where we would switch, yeah, so that he would, we could switch between the two consoles. We matched it up. We had, it oh, was two fantastic. profile systems, so no one at home knew that we were switching literally from one technical to the next technical, um, you know, and that that was great. I but mean, I enjoyed that, that. You know, when for me, that's what it is. If you're gonna yeah. whatever the job is, you're gonna do, do it. T- Better than you think you could do it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I mean, I learned a lot on that gig. We did. That was the first time that we used Dante in a big one in yeah. the country. Yeah. I, I had underneath the stage where no one right. could see. Yeah. I had a Yamaha set up there with Dante recording the backup, and then we had another five systems, Pro Tools systems. We recorded 384 channels for four hours. My word! Non-stop with no glitch on all of our systems. It's lovely. We had ASC students there. I had Grave uh, there. We had Ross there. We had a bunch of guys, and you know, it was technically it ran smooth. You know, and then because control room was right next to us when the when the broadcast finished, yeah, he came out as like he's a phone call from Sky from da 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 da. Everybody's like, yeah, no, know, it's happy. fantastic. It was I a mean, great production that. But I mean, it was. But the thing is, what bring me back now? We planned that. How many how many months ahead of time we were running schedules, channelers? I was working with Jonathan uh, with. Uh, it wasn't Jonathan. It was Dave Tudor at Gearhouse. Right, right. We were planning schedules, production list, channel list with the guys from the UK, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth the whole time. So that by the time we got there, there was no more discussions. It was done. No, there's, no, it's, it's, that's it. You know, yeah, I mean, it was, it's, and it's, everybody knew exactly what you're to not, do. You're not once the gig starts. There's no learning. You've got to know. Yeah. You know, you've and, got to... and you can get to that point even with local gigs by just. Even if it's just me, if it's me with a little thingy with the three-piece band, I can still get there and be relaxed and everything sorted. Yeah, yeah. Communication. Because I mean, I travel the country with, like, with Blue Bamboo is a good example because they're a high-end band. You're talking about Denny Lalouette, Marlon, Brendan Ross, sure. Sydney Mabundla. Sure. You know, and technically, we get booked for a high-end international wedding down in, on the coast somewhere. Yeah. So they come with an expectation already whether it's catering or the whole well, thing that's is the like thing. They, you know, that first world that they live in, but that's to what get, they expect. To get the kit around that band yeah. somewhere on the beach in East London, <laughs> you know, yeah. is difficult. Very. You know, but, but it is possible. It's always possible. And we send the riders through. And then what, I find what the guys do wrong is they don't plan. They get the gig. They don't plan. Then in the week on the build-up, mm. they start now because they've got to drive. 45 minutes to the way the venue is, then then we'll get a phone call. Okay, well, what keyboard do you guys want? So, well, you got our rider. Yes. Okay, but we don't have. The, we're going to have to go to PE to get that, and we have. It's like there's two parts to this this conversation, you know. Yeah. And 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 this is what we're talking about. People in our industry, some people in our industry, and I'm, I'm not being derogatory. Yeah, yeah. But you got to start so that. When the time it comes to the, the, the show, it's done. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. On the day of the show, there should not be any, any funny, you forth. know, looking things, you know, that kind of situation. Yeah. There was something else I wanted to say. Just in communication, planning. Yeah. I mean, it's, you have two different people. I mean, oh, this is what I wanted to say. I think the thing about what we're talking about here and the preparation and mm. communication stuff is the first point of entrance for us, okay? No matter how many gigs you do that are similar to each other, okay? Every gig you do, you should be looking at as a brand new thing, you know? Correct. And, and, the, and that's why... Because the nuances why, change. Yeah, and that's, I mean, every, there are so many differences between each gig, mm. you know? And that's what it is. I mean, you know? what, one of the common things I get on the sound side without traveling with Tien Shodan or whoever, yeah. then I'll phone the cup production company or the, the company that got the gig, I got booked for it, and then they got my rider. And if it's a two-piece, you know, I've got, I've got different riders, and it's contextual to what I'm doing. Sure, you know? yeah. And then they'll, they'll defend by saying, well, but last week so-and-so used it and they were happy. And so-and-so is like, yeah, but I'm not so-and-so and this is not so-and-so. For me to pull that off the gig... It. True to the client who booked me, you know, because there's a reason I get booked. 
You know, Absolutely. There's a reason I'm traveling with the band. Absolutely. And there's a reason why every band member in the band is then doing their thing. And for order for them to fulfill that, they need support. You know, they need their, their tools. And it comes, I mean, even sound desk. I mean, you might have spent 30K on a sound desk. But if it doesn't have some of the features I need to do a specific job, I'm not dissing your sound desk. No. It is a good desk yeah. for another gig, but not for this one. Like O1Vs, for example. O1Vs are it's like a Leatherman. Right. There's so many O1Vs in this country, it's not even funny. And they yeah. work very well to a point. They were, they were the first venture the, 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 into the digital, the, the, wasn't the O3D it? O3D was the, oh, okay, the, the, oh, the predecessor, yeah. but the O1V and the O1V uh, um, version 2. And then, but if I'm doing Blue Bamboo, I need six stereo in-ear systems out of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I want to run in effects. It's only got yeah. four, it's got four omni outs and a left right. Right. But then the guy puts, he buys an expansion, a uh, Behringer expansion to get more outputs. But it still only has eight auxiliaries. Well, that's, you see, that only, goes back like, to what we're like, talking about. I mean, it's like a lot of times I would get a, a, a question from either be a client or, or a tech company. I mean, just diverse a second. There's, I know of a tech company that I don't even know if they exist anymore. But their attitude was, to, this is to backline. Now, we will give them what we give them. Okay, and they must deal with it. And I, and I would I've, go. I've heard that many times. But you times. know, I don't know why you want to do that because your livelihood depends on servicing those people. Mm. Because you're a tech company, it doesn't mean you dictate to the market. You know. Yeah. So that was the one point. Okay, but a lot of times I get a question of, listen, this guy wants a a, a Kurzweil PC88 piano. Okay. But we've got a motif. The motif is like newer. Why should there be that? Why does this guy want this kit and that guy wants that kit and this bass player wants this amp? And, and I'll just say, you know what? The reason why you have all this stuff is because they, the musician is a creative being and he will want to use what inspires him. Mm. So when you come along with something familiar. that he doesn't know, yeah. You might as well ask him to play on tin cans. I, I use the example of, you know, cars. If I put you in a, from a BMW into a Volkswagen yeah. 1960s, mm. you can still drive. Sure. You know, if I, if I go the other way around from an old Beetle to a new BMW, you can still drive. You might switch on the wipers instead of the flicker and you have to adjust <laughs> the chair. And yeah. These days it's not even a key hole. And, but nothing takes away from the fact that you can drive. Nothing, no. You still know where you want to go. Your objective is clear. Correct. But if I do that and you're a racing driver, different I, issue. there has to be a specific different set issue. of tools. You know? Total. And, and even going from one type of race to another type of race, the tool has to follow. Yeah. And none of that takes away. So a pianist can play piano. He can play piano. But if he's booked to do second keys, you know, and he's got to do da-da-da-da. So when he puts in an XF7 and a... And a, and a uh, Jupiter AT and XYZ. There's reason behind those. And yes, other keyboards will work, but it will it deliver? Well, what, that's and, the point. You know. So the guy's going to sit there and go, you know, and it's that mindset you were talking about. That he'll sit there and you told him now, well, you've got to use this. And instead of losing the gig, he's going to sit there. And for half an hour, instead of being relaxed and getting creative for the gig, he's trying to find and stuff. And what's going to happen in the, in the, when he's playing? So, But that's what it is. I mean, it's it's... You cannot dictate to the person who's delivering. Yeah, I mean, I use, yeah. a, I use a very stupid, crude, I've got kids, so, you know, if you watch the movie Shark Tale, there's a point in the beginning of the movie where he goes to the boss, which is the blowfish, and he asks for more money or a raise or something, I can't even remember what, and the boss takes a scroll and he rolls out the scroll with all the fish that starts from, from whales all the way down. Right at the bottom, there's plankton, yeah. plankton poop, and then him. <laughs> it's like, you're at the bottom of the list. Yeah. You can only go up, you know, and that's yeah. what inspires him. But you yeah. need to understand where you are on the totem pole. That's it. We might be good sound engineers, but in an event or at a gig, we, we have to service, we have to deliver, and understand that the, folk, the audience didn't come because I'm doing sound. That's it. Or I'm using a, that's an, a, an Avid console. That's you know, it. There, there's some techies there that appreciate that. But they came for the artist on stage. They came for the experience for the event. So everything that we need to do needs to be towards that outcome. And you know, I, I spoke about that 
you know, if you've got the wrong attitude as a sound tech and your perspective is out and there's an artist that's about to go on stage and you have the wrong discussion with them, you derail them. You know, that reminds me. Or you come, yep. or someone's, yep. I mean, and I've seen this happen, someone that's a nervous artist, and they exist. Sure. They stand there or a nervous guitarist or something and then the techies and a young techie, and I've, I've taken guys to task on this. Right where they're standing there and then they'll have, they, they're just chilling because now you know, the next thing's going to happen. This guy's about to walk up. Then you say, oh, this afternoon we realized that that amp wasn't working properly, so we twiddle in it, but it should be fine now. That is like... The, exactly. You That's like dropping you a bomb do? in their lap. Exactly, because <laughs> now you've just derailed that guy completely. Yeah. You know? yeah. If he comes up on stage and asks you a question, you answer it short, sharp, discreet. You, know? you need to appreciate what they're in for. You know, and it's like, if what you're about to say is not contributing positively to the situation, shut up. That's it. Quiet. That's it. You know, if they, if they want to talk to you, they'll talk to you. Um, I think also your attitude on introduction is important, you know. Yeah, and, and James said it on Tuesday so well. He says there's, there's, a, there's a point where, in his, what he's had to learn and what he's had to go through is that point of, of empathy. You have to understand, and every muse is different. Yeah. Some guys are aggressive by yeah. nature and they want, you know, you in your face and mm. other guys are passive they need reassurance other guys just need to be left alone yeah and you as a as a monitor guy for example you need to learn figure that out with four guys on stage very quickly the way i communicate to him 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 is all different correct you know and correct. from a backline perspective the same thing if you throw that bomb while well, they must just use what's here well i mean i've got my when i started i was a bass player mm. okay and then I started, you're still a bass player oh, well i still play it comes to get you every now and then <laughs> <laughs> but um when I started, I was a bass player and I had this backline thing I was starting, right? I didn't have a company. I was just doing backline. Yeah. Okay. And every, for the first, I mean, it must have been, I'm a quick learner, so it must have been about three or four months. All right. On every gig, I would be setting up as a musician, but not from this perspective of, of being able to interpret I had this attitude of comparing. So the bass player would come up and I'd play and I'd be sussing out the bass player as to whether he's worthy or not. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or I would, I would insist on picking up his bass to show him my chops. Okay? Yeah. Big mistake. Yeah. Big mistake. You I, know? I, I remember. The, on they the, don't want to know about that. I had a technician. 10 years ago, nice guy, yeah. really worth his salt, yeah. really works well. Yeah. I had to take him on the side and I said, dude, calm down. Because he's having, he's telling stories and getting so, he's get, becoming distracting because he's, he's so passionate. I know. And he's a muso, so he's asking questions about everything and starting conversations. Yeah. Like, yeah. the guys are trying to do their stuff and we've got a yeah. time, like, there's a time and place. Yeah. You know, there's, it's yeah. just. Calm down. I'm not telling you change who you are, but adapt to the situation. No, that's what it was. Yeah. It was and, you know, and one of the guys, a really nice guy from England, I, he was a monitor engineer. Okay? And I was, and I was doing my thing. You know? And it's off-putting to the musician. Mm. Because it doesn't matter if you're better or worse. Because, I mean, who decides on what's better or worse? But yeah. it's not about that. He's doing that gig because he's the right guy for the gig. Exactly. You know? They're not going to come and fire him and employ me because I've got better chops. That's not going to happen. And yeah. this monitoring guy came. He said, listen, mate, I understand what you're doing, but don't do it because they're not interested in that. They're interested in you helping them to the point where they can play. Yeah, make them the better. And this was them. the biggest lesson I learned in all the years I've been doing that. Yeah. And I took the change. I made the change. When I'm doing a backline, I'm a backline person. Mm. It doesn't matter if I can play or not. When I'm on a stage or in a studio or recording, I'm a musician. Backline doesn't matter. You should, and that's the yeah. biggest lesson. We had the, I mean, I've had this discussion as well where I've, I've often been in this situation, you know, me, Marius, Adrian, a couple of hours, where there's international gigs yeah. and we get booked as front of house. And it's a festival, so there might be one or two bands with no guys that so you'll you'll mix those, but most of the bands come with their own engineers. Yeah. And then again, even set up on the console, you can't set up your workflow and your tricks and trades. No. Because he's going to walk in, and then 
he doesn't want to adapt to your style, and it's not not up to me to tell him while well, he's doing that wrong, or you, or you can no. do that so much better, no. that so much faster. And I, but I've seen youngsters do that, and I, and I use the word youngsters generically because it's life more inexperienced. I've yeah. I've been in the situation where I've walked up to a console where I come with the band, and the guy's showing me all the tricks that he's got set up, and I was like, can you just disable all of that? I just want this. I'd rather go back to bare basic yes. than try and figure that out. Well, and I'm not dissing your knowledge or your skill. Not at all. But it's not appropriate to what I'm trying to do here. Because, I mean, I'd, I had the fortunate opportunity to mix um, uh, 30 Seconds to Mars. Right. When they were out in 2009, I think it was. Yeah, my, the Coke Fest. Yes. Mm. So they came out and they were using the engineers from another band. And that went sour between management. So right. It ended up that they didn't have engineers. And I was there with my console in front of us, um, babysitting. Yeah, and doing your the thing. The guy had already done the sound check for 30 seconds. So I w and I observed the sound check. But he, was, he did that on top of his band who's playing Later's yeah. template. Yeah. Oh, I, see, I remember were, something. There was some yeah, kind of thing like that. And, and then, uh, and, uh, but I, a lot of the stuff he was doing on that console, you know, I'm an expert on the console because I train on them. Sure. And he was doing things that I could see that he's, he's trying to emulate something that comes from another console yeah, or workflow yeah. and all that. And he did some weird stuff. And I left his weird stuff. I set up because he sent his rider. We plugged yeah. it in. Yeah. Left it. He put his stick in. Recall. There's his set. Okay, cool. And then he got 30 seconds up and he edited his thing for them. And I'm like, I can see some of these things going south. But you know what? It's his thing. And I, and I gave him everything he wanted. And I could have fixed a lot of stuff, but I didn't. And then... Literally half an hour before they went on stage, I got the call, you know, can you do front of house for them? I'm like, yeah, yeah okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, um, but now I've got all these things. So I, because of my skill on the console, I quickly just duplicated, changed it, finished the set. Then we went to Cape Town and I fixed a couple of the stuff and made right. it my own. Yeah. You know, and I really enjoyed doing a band Nothing of that. like being thrown into the oh, deep end. Oh man, I love that. <laughs> But you know, this is what you're talking is also similar to this. As a friend of ours guy, okay, it's it's the same sort of example of someone in the audience going, "You've got too much bass," or "It's too loud." Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, maybe it is for them, but do they know what actually is going on here? Look, I mean, there's you a know? whole there's a whole psyche there. You know, if if you think about it, five thousand people at an event. I don't know of a sound guy in the world that can make all five thousand happy. No. It's no. impossible. No. Um, it, the, and, and, and happy is a relative term. Mm. You know, if a guy had a fight with his wife on the way there, he's in a bad mood. Yep. So the smallest little thing, yep. you know, the artist being yep. 30 seconds oh, yeah. late is just, you know, or a bad seating position and now he's focusing on other stuff and the sound and blah, blah, blah. So there's so many different things. I mean, I've, being at the sound desk, you often, you're like the quickest guy to get to. Yes. You know, no, no, you become a target for you, sure. You know, a guy comes and moans, I'm sitting there and there's this light that keeps shining in my eyes. You know, and, I'm like, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, there's different say. ways of dealing with that. And I, that was in one of my episodes. I talked about how I deal with that kind of stuff. But it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, communication and having that service level, service-minded attitude, mm. how important that is. So um, coming back to Backline, I mean, from our side, obviously, we're sitting in SB Music Room now, which is our rehearsal space. We've been here now. It's two years. Is it two years already? Two, two years happened during lockdown, yeah. My gosh. And um, from the beginning, I mean, I've, I've, I own one piece of backline, which is that little Fender amp there. Yes. Which I bought. I, I can eight, see. Eight I can see. It's, it's still new. But that that <laughs> only leaves the office for one. I bought that for Anton Lemur, who plays yeah. for Tien Yeah. Because traveling locally, yeah. trying to find an amp that works. Oh, gosh. You know, so oh, gosh. I, you know, I thought, you know what, let me just, I'll buy it. And I actually got a, a uh, got it from Music Connection. At a, it was a second-hand one. That's uh, good. Got a good deal on that's it. I good... actually got Anton to come play it that's in, a, the, that's play it in the shop. One. Yeah. yeah. Anton came and played on it. He said, thumbs up. So yeah. I bought it, put it in a yeah. flight case, and I would travel around with this thing. Great. Um, and that's why I have it. So it stays here in the music room, and it does 10 gigs, you know, if yeah. and where we can. Yeah. Um, and as I do that as a favor because a lot of the places to give costs down on the gig, I just put the amp there, you know, the guy doesn't have to go get something. Sure. But, you know, I realized, fortunately, many years ago, Sound GP, as, as we stand now, our focus is live broadcast and recording. Right. So our infrastructure is consoles, mics, cabling, up to kazoo, yeah. microphones up to mm -hmm. kazoo. Backline, 
there's you. Oh yeah, well, I'm start. glad I mean, we have this association. Because I mean, basically we've got a set kit that sits in this room, which is, I mean, we've got this master series. Yeah. And we've got, it's not a bad kit, but it's not on riders anymore. Yeah, it's, it's so you know. That, that's, I mean, I remember the conversation we had where, you know, I, I want to put decent stuff that the guys are willing to rehearse on. And the most common thing that we have to change out is keyboards. And that's based on what we've keyboards, been saying. Keyboards, yeah, I mean, it's because, it's they, difficult one because they change all the time. But, I mean, that, that SWR bass amp there, yep. any guy will sit down now and play with it. Sure. You know, because it's, it's a rehearsal. You've got to understand, I, I don't have to put a double stack, you know. I think, yeah, you know, rehearsal's uh, funny enough, which, which is not pertinent to, to our country yet. Mm. And I say yet. It's becoming. We, we we're making we're it part of make our workflow where, especially with live DVD, DVD recordings that we do and the TV programs yeah. we do, like Gospel Avenue yeah. we're busy with yeah. now, we set up the band here with the ME systems and the monitoring solution. And then when they're done rehearsals, we take the whole kit. We well, that's what I was going to say. There. I mean, a typical example of, let's say, uh, uh, an international artist recording, I mean, rehearsing for a tour or something. Mm. They will have this kind of situation for yeah. weeks. Yes. And they will record I and mean, play and play. And once everything is known and all the musicians own the music so they don't have to read it and do all that stuff, then what they will do is they will go into a re re rehearsal space Similar for to two that. to three weeks, but it's a stage. Yes. It's exactly as it's going to be set up on stage. Yeah. And the reason for that is also rehearsal, so that when, when the drummer gets onto the kit, it's, the kit, it's exactly right. And when he plays, it's exactly what they want to hear. I remember so, speaking to uh, the engineer from Muse when, at, at 2009 at the yeah, Coke Fest. Yeah. It's the first time Muse came out, and yep. I know there was big hoo-ha about their rider, right? Which was 100% this or nothing. Yes. And they came off the lighting rig. The PA was set up according to their specifications That's right. because it was high end, mm. and everybody else played mm. within that. But then on stage, all they needed was a 63 amp power. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. They came with their own crew, their own range, their own truck and transport, own backline. They had the see-through drum kit. All Correct. of that kind of stuff. And they, I was speaking to the sound guy. They were set up in a, in a warehouse for three months in Ireland with this exact setup, practicing yeah, yeah. and producing the tour. But that also then means when they go traveling, there's no room for any change. No. Everything has to have 100% because they're running out of time code and it just works. You know, that, and they sound the same worldwide. Well, that's the, I mean, that's the, uh, that's the, the goal. Mm. You know, but I mean, not even big internationals. Sort of, there's a there's a handful of those kind that of internationals. I know? remember you two. Interesting enough, you um, two travel uh, everywhere. Uh, Kevin Sound Stylist gave yep. me a call because um, he, it was actually his idea to try and get them to broadcast the Cape Town show when they were yep. down here. Yep. And they did it into Africa and onto the YouTube channel. They didn't right. do it in South Africa. Yeah, uh, we did a radio broadcast. So. Um, he phoned me up because the, 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 the guy that travels with him, because they had a broadcast engineer that just travels with him. Sure. Just in case. And he's part of the audio team, and when it's broadcast, it's him. So um, he wanted the profile set up with the Pro Tools and all that and that kind of stuff, and he has recording. So we went down to Cape Town. We set that up, um, and we got to go into that whole rig, which was amazing to see amazing. how that crew works. Yeah. But they get to the stadium, and the entire backline stage system with monitoring consoles, everything gets set up in the ballroom at the stadium. Yeah. Up until two o'clock, in case one of the band guys wants to come and do something. That's it. Fully teched, fully staffed, fully running. And the edge actually on and Cape Town, the edge came, spoke to his guitar tech about one pedal yeah. and then left. Yeah. That's all he did. And then at two o'clock, an hour later everything's on stage. That's you know, it. that's how the crew works. And it's just a machine, it's polished. Um, I mean they ran four monitor consoles, one for each muso, literally. Yeah. Um, and then but we've just seen that machine and the communication. Their logistics team, I think, was 15 guys managing the 300 local crew or something like that. It was quite no, a, it's just, I mean, a, a, another one we did, I mean, another band like that was Metallica. Mm. Okay. Uh, we didn't supply any gear for them. Okay. We only supplied gear for the rehearsal room. Okay. Okay. Which was the gear that they the, use on the, stage. The same stuff. Okay. Now. Same stuff. But, and that was just for them in to case. come in at any time they want. And the funny, interesting thing about Metallica is any of the musicians picks up any guitar or sits at the drum kit, record. Every oh, wow. single thing gets recorded. That's what they do. Yeah. It's the weirdest thing. And I said, you know, and the reasoning, 
as far as their guy was concerned, was that because you don't know where the hit's going to come from. Yeah, they might You don't be know what you're going to find when you listen back to this. Yeah. You know? And it's true because you can't, you can't pre, pre-propose a hit song. You know? I mean, we, did, we, we were involved with uh, Mumford & Sons, which was produced locally and Master yeah. Max mixed it. Yeah. Uh, but they recorded at SABC and yeah. Eddie and my guys, we actually went in and set up our recording solution and they tracked, I can't remember how many songs, um, just because they were on tour. Yeah. I've done that for uh, when Don Moen was on tour a couple of years ago. That's he it. phoned me up and he said, uh, yeah, I pulled you in for that yeah. one. You brought us I back line. We yeah. were in M3 at SABC. That's it. And they were just in t- they had like two days between concerts and he's got some ideas, he wants to track some songs. You know? That's and, the one. And a lot of guys do that. That's the one. I mean, yeah, at the rehearsal room, we, we, everything gets recorded. There's always a console running, there's always recording. So after every rehearsal, the MD can listen back. There you go. Yeah. We, if he can either take a drive immediately or we drop it onto Dropbox. And, you know, it, it becomes valuable stuff for him to build into his session for the show. You know what's good about that also is it creates the industry. Mm. You know, um, well, we've, we've tried to set a standard. We're trying to raise the bar in what the musos can start expecting, what it should be like as a muso. I mean, I shouldn't have to struggle with in I shouldn't have to struggle with this. I shouldn't have to struggle with waiting, you know, because that's totally, a big thing I, I totally. push with our guys is call time, setup time, line check time, muso time. You know, the musos are called for a six o'clock sound check. That means they're probably going to arrive just after five. We've got to be done way before that, so that yeah, when they arrive, four. our focus <laughs> yeah. goes to them. Well, that's it. You know. You know? Yeah, I think when I, you know, when I talk like that, it's like um, just di- digressing a little. Mm. Is I get a question: Is why do we have to? Why does this band have to have this drum kit and that band have to have that drum kit? Or why do we have to change all this equipment? You know, and some people love because I'm a little bit of an activist like that because yeah. I believe that. If we want to get onto the world stage, we've got to be like the world. Yeah. You know? And going back to what inspires you, the band, this and that. But more than that, let's say we're doing a festival and there's only one set of backline. Okay? Yeah. Or there's two drum kits in the same set of backline. Okay? That's all good and well. The guy comes and does a sound check and then your techie goes and he marks the, the amp and he marks and he marks. It's not going to come back to the same place, ever. Mm. Okay. Why would the, the the 2010 or the Mandela concert have all individual gear for each band? Yeah. Because of those things. Because you're so only remember, as good as your last gig. I remember locally we did a thing. Uh, you got your guys were there with Gearhouse that um, that encounter at Nasrec, and they did one in the Dome as well. Yeah, yeah. Where. Um, I think Kirk Franklin was there, a couple of internationals. And they had that back line. And then they stayed on their rider for our use only. Yeah, exclusive use. Exclusive use. So exactly. Right. Your guys came out today when it's done, top over, push to the side. And then I saw another band arrive and the guy goes, well, I, I want to use that. Exactly. They do that. I want to use that organ. And then they think, you know, and then the, the comment is, no, no, that's for so-and-so. No, but I, I know how to use it. I'm not going to break it. It's not the point. And then they go, oh, these Americans are so arrogant. Yeah. And it's not the Americans. It's not. The it's th- the industry and it's your management that needs to, you know, get your riders right, specify your stuff right, and, and work with the system. Well, you know, why a rider? Why anything? Because their machine, their production, their everything, they want to deliver the best they can yeah. on the day. Correct. So what happens here is... No, no, no. These guys will just have to use that. It's it's such an insult to the musician. Mm. It really no, it is, is, you know. Um, but look, I mean, having said that, there are, I mean, with you guys involved and in the companies when we get, we, we are trying to lift the standard. We are well, doing, we we, got we've it. got some really good gigs that happen yeah. constantly. More, I think there's more good gigs on a larger scale than bad gigs at this point. Yes. Um, and, but it's budgeting, it's production, all that. But I think people people throw the word budget out a lot. As, well, a, yeah. as a problem. That's it. That's it. But it becomes a problem when you didn't plan. Well, I mean, when what on is the budget? day you got to make phone. <laughs> if I phone you on the day and I yeah. got to get you to Poch of Struem, yeah. there's transport costs involved. There's this, there's this, there's this. It's off the, you know, there's no favors anymore. Well, that's the, you I, know, I didn't that's... plan. But if I phone you three weeks, I said, in three weeks' time, I've got a gig there. We don't have a tight budget. Can I send a van to pick up the organ? Got a tech, da 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 da. 
what can you charge? Then now I'm being responsible and I'm planning and I'm doing things in a way where we can we can work within the budgets. Because budgets think, yeah. exist for a reason, but you have to communicate. You have to understand how to uh, manipulate. It's a strong word, but you have to manipulate budgets. You well, have you to know, work the thing with is, what you've got. So sure. that when you go, and if you do it properly and you go back to client or production, you say, listen, I need X. And you can show what you've done already. Then you're more likely to get a little bit of X extra sure whereas sure. on the day you standing in pots of Sturm and there's no organ or there's no this the client's looking at dude this is your problem you made the mistake solve it and you job but it's going to cost me 12 grand it's going to cost me more than you paying me exactly <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <it's, laughs> but you know what it is for me I, and, you, and I, i've the, heard guys say that to I, me i get to a venue and the guy goes yeah but if i did that if i hired that in that would have been more than they're paying me for the gig i said but why did you take the gig then well, that's going back to what you said. I mean, this word budget yeah. is a strange one because a budget, the way I understand it, is you, you want to do X, okay? And you work what X needs, mm. okay, financially. And that's your budget, Yeah. okay? Or you're going to go, okay, I have got a million rand. I want to put on a Mandela concert. It's not going to happen, okay? Yeah. So what can I do with the million rand to make it nice and fair for everybody? Everybody, you know, and that's what yeah. it is. I mean, know? I've had many discussions with creative guys that say, "Listen, we I sit around a table and they go, oh, we want to do da 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 da.'" And then in that meeting, without pulling out papers and everything, you can say, "Listen, I, I hear what you're saying; it's going to be amazing, but that's going to cost a lot of money because you know more." And you or can say it why it's going to cost a lot of money. If in that point you then say, "Listen, if we change X, Y, Z, or..." approach it from this perspective, we can achieve that, what you're thinking about, but it'll be cheaper. You why, know, but that comes from experience and all that kind of stuff. Why production meetings are so important. Exactly. You know, and people don't do them. Yeah. But, and I've been in yeah. similar meetings where the guys say that and they go, X and you say it's going to be and they say, we know, but that's what we want. And yeah. Then yeah. You, you yeah. do your thing, but I then think, you have to deliver. I think any, anything can be done yeah. at any time with any condition. As long as it is communicated. Correct. And as long as it works out fair for everybody. Yeah. You know? No, I mean, I did a gig. You can't get away from that. I did a gig recently. I'm not going to mention where, what, or how. Okay? Um, it's a big gig. Okay? I get called in. Can you do the back line for me? Yes, of course we can. Blah, blah, blah. I'll need all the riders. I get the riders. I, okay, I do my quote. Okay? The, oh, it's a little steep, you know? I don't know if it's the first time we're doing this gig. I said, okay, cool. I will, you know, what, have you, what, have you, what did you plan? Blah, blah, blah. And we settled, okay? And this goes back to budgets and how it's formulation and planning, okay? So then I get, getting closer to the gig now, it's like two weeks to the gig, and I go, we need to have a production meeting, you know? Oh, okay, so I'll get all the, you know, we need the audio person, the lighting, go, so we go sit down, you know? And we're talking about it, and I go, this guy's the, the front of house, I say, Cool. How do you do? I don't know him, so I'm already going, okay, because you know most people in the industry. And anyway, he says, okay, now we look at this, the drawings. And he shows me this lovely drawing. It's a beautiful stage, beautiful lighting rig. Everything is looking great. And I said, but this thing, where's the monitor, monitor disc? And where is the, the backstage? Access, yeah. The access. Because I've got to set up five sets of backline. Oh, no, I thought you were just going to do this and there's, there's a back line there, a drum kit and on the picture. Or do you have to bring other? And I went, wow. Yeah. Okay, so then I explained. I said, you know, yeah, this is how it's got to go and blah, 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 blah. And set up day, which is like four days before the gig, I go to the, to the venue and I eventually have to get hold of the, the build stage build. And I said, no, what we need is X. Mm. Oh, but there's no budget for this. You know, I phone the principal and I go, you know, we can't deliver unless. Yeah. Because we've got to clear the stage and then put up the new gear. It's like, a, it's like an inexperienced... And we solved that problem. Okay. Mm. But however, the real problem came when on the first day, the first band was sound checking. It was great. Okay. So then they finished the sound and we removed the gear and we bring the new gear on. And how many, how many lines does a stage normally have? 40 lines, 35 lines? All these days you've got a 64 rack as a starting okay, point. Okay, so yeah. 
And there were the PA techs, and, and I really, my heart bled for them. Not one cable was marked. Mm. So it was like, okay, the drums, bass drum. No, that's not it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, on the night, two bands performed out of five. Mm. And they had to call another PA company from somewhere else to come and solve the problem. On the night. I know what you're talking about. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So, uh, planning is so important. No, it is. And it's I so think, important. You know, it's, it's something where, and this, I mean, time and experience comes into it. When you've done something, you've done it. Yeah. And you learn, and yeah. it becomes a valuable contribution. But you also shouldn't become a know-it-all and trying to dictate, you know, because there's, there's it's, like, it's like James was also saying, and, and I said it, you know, I can teach anybody a skill, but I can't teach you an understanding. If you're an arrogant Unhappy a, guy that no one wants to be around. It doesn't matter how good you are. You know, you might get some work, but there's a lot of people that don't want to work with you. I've, you know? I've developed a nice little sort of definition thing for ego. Mm. Okay? Because essentially that's ego. Yeah, yeah. Okay? And ego dictates that you know everything. So the problem about knowing everything is you can never learn anything. Correct. You know, you shut off. And in our industry, I mean, I learned this early on, and you did, I'm sure. Okay, the most valuable asset you could have is to ask questions. Yeah. Because Honestly. you can't learn if you don't ask a question. Yeah. And the things change so quickly. You know, and this example I've just given you is exactly that. Yeah. You know, yes, I am a front of house engineer. I'm a technical company. I've got a PA, but we do corporate gigs. It's a totally different ball different game. Market. You know, yeah. you can come with corporate your approach, you can come with your approach. tablet and you can mix from your tablet if it's a, if it's a corporate. Yeah, you know, it's not ideal, but you can. You know, mm. because they, but there's time. I mean, and the same and gig. A, I mean, the, when 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 the poo hit the fan, okay, and the, the 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 solution company came down and said, "Where's the monitor desk?" Oh no, no it's in the case. We didn't we didn't think we would need it. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, look, and, it's, and it's not those people weren't wrong. Yeah, they just weren't informed. It's, but it's like you say, it's communication, and I think there's enough. Uh, there, there's a, there's a between, and I've seen this with a couple of young companies. Yeah, where they don't want to, they show weakness by bringing in someone else, or show Correct. weakness by outsourcing. Yeah, you know, if yeah. you've got, if you've got, and I get this from my students all the time. You know, they say, "Listen, I've got three hundred thousand rand. What PA should I buy?" Like nothing. And they go, what do you mean? I said, well, where's, who is your clients? What's your business plan? Exactly. What are you buying you it for? You can do a gig tomorrow by yourself without owning anything. Correct. What? I said, put that money in the bank. And build relationships. I mean, even here where we are, we've got Fogdeg down the road. We've got all these companies yeah. right around us. Yeah. We, we were at their door the whole time. I'm not going to buy DJ gear. I'm not going to buy this. I'm not going to buy PA. Correct. I've got relationship with guys. I can do any event. I outsource. Right. But I work in my business plan. You got your profit margin, and you do. I do what I do well, and we've built what around what we've got based on what our clients want. So we've grown similar to you within a sphere of a niche market. Correct. Um, but that also means I can now become a source for other people on microphones and that kind of sure. stuff. Um, but it's having a business plan, you know. Well, it's it's it's, it's being. It's, it's, you see, it's having a business, a proper business. I mean, to compare to what you're saying, the downside of what you're saying. Okay, when you know what you're doing and you know and you know your preparation, you know all that mm. stuff, because you can go to Fogtech and get something, but you're not going to take it from Fogtech onto the gig. You're going to come and check it out. Yeah, come here as part of our prep list. Where we scan it yeah, into our system. Yeah. Whereas, if I like, uh, uh, you go to Nigeria. Okay, I've been to Nigeria many times, and fortunately, supplying my whole package. Okay, mm. but I know of instances where. Where the client has gone, no, 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 I can get the stuff locally. And what happens is you have one guy who owns a drum kit, one guy who owns a bass amp, one guy, and then the whoever it is starts outsourcing of the stuff, okay? But it goes from that guy onto the stage. So the cymbal stands won't have any wing nuts because they get lost mm. because you can't buy them in Nigeria. Yeah. So you end up with, the, with, the, with, with trash. C3 on the keyboard doesn't work properly and... You see what I'm saying? So, yeah. um, reputable places and companies like we have here, there's no problem really doing yeah. that. You know. No, no, it's true. And um, I mean, when I've done like the the 
we did the, the experience in Algeria, which yeah. is the biggest gospel concert, yeah. concert in the world. Yeah. It's every year now for the last four or five years, it's 500,000 people plus right. in the audience for 12 hours with 22 bands, you know, everything from Kirk Franklin, Donnie McLaughlin, yeah, yeah, Don yeah. Moen. That's a big geek. That's massive. And Planet Shakers, I've been there with them. And there, but it's a British company with, uh, with guys running the, 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 the team. Um, and you walk up, and as you walk onto stage as a band, the ba stage manager meets us, who are you, who are you, who are you, who are you, you go there, you go there, you go there, and there's a tech waiting for you. I go to the monitor console, and there's my file, the one I sent through to him. He talks me through it, he has my frequencies. I, I, I travel with the radio mic, so a piece of paper, there's the frequencies you're gonna tune to. That, my technical setup takes two minutes, and I'm done. My band's ready. We do a sound check in 20 minutes. We get off stage. We come back for the show. I literally walk up, plug my headphones in, do the show, and walk away. Mm. And everything works. But mm. the team is organized. The team is planned. You know, that, that's an amazing feeling when you, when you send a ride and you get there. And like, you know, you go to Nigeria and you expect, <gasps> and you get there. Like, but wow. they've had to outsource it, you know. Um, but I mean, there's some there's some great opportunities. I think for for, for uh, there's got to be take home value as well. I think if anybody listening to this is, the theme is communication. Understand what your purpose is. Understand your skill set required to fulfill that purpose, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and keep growing, keep learning, sure. keep adapting. Sure. You know, have the right attitude, have the right use opportunities that you get, um, and you know. Guys that are watching this that are in positions where they can do riders and work with bands. If you don't know how to do a rider, you know, give me a shot. I've done yeah, riders for we bands. can. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I can help. You know, if it's I've even I'd love got, to do I've that. got riders for local. I've got riders for travel. I've got riders for different bands based on the fact that we might not get gear yeah, and more. Yeah. And that I'll have. I even still have on some of my riders. I have an analog option on consoles. You should. And then you should if it's analog, you, yeah. I want X Y Z backline yeah. with this. Yeah. And then, but, you know. You see, I think, you know, also, I think um, going along with what we're talking about and if we're talking riders and that kind of thing, education is valuable. Yeah. And, I mean, us technical people, I I'm, I'm gladly have any muso, any production for me, how to set up a rider. Yeah. You know, I'd love to. I mean. The, the thing is, the reason that's important is because you're the one that gets the rider. I'm the one that gets the rider. It's got to, it's got to read. You know, I, I get some riders, which you can see has been set up by the hospitality and management. Well, exactly. Where there's a lot of detail about a bunch of stuff. And then the technical section is written in English, very basic. You know, all and you it doesn't, it, it, it raises more questions than it answers the, because the, they contradict each other. Or the equipment list is, is, is gear that doesn't yeah. exist. So we get a channel list, we get a channel list and we get a gear list. Yeah. It's like. They don't that match. doesn't match. Yeah. You've got X, Y, Z, but where am I going to plug it in now? If I plug, if I do this, then that's not in use. So are you using that keyboard? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we forgot to, we've got the old channel list. Or you've got the old gear list we've changed. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I've come across, I mean, some bands, local bands, they use different musos for different gigs, mm. you know? Yeah. So. Which is fine. They, that's fine. But then we have a, have a rider whereby we, that's the ideal. Okay. But we can use this and we can use that. You know, we want a Yamaha motif, okay, XF7 or 8, but we could use an S90ES, or we could use a montage, or we, whatever it is. Yeah. But you have one or two alternatives so that your gig is going to be great because yeah. the reason for the rider, the reason for the technical, the reason for the, is so that the musos can play the best gig they can play. Correct. Yeah, we, we, we started with our guys. I mean, the first thing I do when I work on a production is a channelist. Yeah. I start with it, and we did this with a voice. Me and Adrian yeah. and, and Simon, who sat with a channelist. Yeah. What's the final of the voice going to look like? Right. The final. Yeah. I and mean, this is almost a year before then. Sure. We drew up a channel list of the final, and then we had a column in there with dates. When is what going to be used? So when we set up for the blind rehearsals, mm -hmm. our channelist was still that channelist, but we only used aspects of it. Yeah. And as we grew to the next stage, to the next stage, to the next stage, all of us, when we said, now we've got three BVs, it's like, okay, where are we going to plug them in? No, there. There, they're already there. That's we've now got a live percussion. There. Totally you know, It's right. all done, it's planned, but, it's, it, but you, you've got to think ahead and think of, and it's outcome-based, you know. So communication is key, and I think 
and and I didn't do this 20 years ago. Sure. 20 years sure. ago was like, okay, I've patched the stage. Let me go to the desk and write out my channel list. You know, because I was Correct. only out there running around. <laughs> it's all in my head. You know? Yes, I know. <laughs> Put I mean, the tape I don't down and write. You know, even, there's my you, channel. List. You know, even you have gigs whereby it's, there's, there's multiple bands and it's not a big stage and there's mm. no changeover space. Okay, I learned something from from the the Prince's Trust gig in England a couple of years ago, which I just saw on TV. Mm. And what they did there, similar situation, all big bands, all like Queen and all those, right? And they built the stage set. Okay staggered with all the gear on it all of the gear so they just walked to different positions okay. and the musos would come on and if, if i mean the queen kit was there only queen uses that kit but it was set up yeah and there was another kit here and there was another kit there but then your stage is 35 meters wide well it's, it's, 16 it's a meters set deep. okay yeah. yeah and the musos just come on and they go to their position and they play you know that's a brilliant way of doing it's, it. it it worked fantastic and it was visually wonderful. Yeah, you know, some guys go, yeah, but what's, a, what's a, you can't have a drum kit there with nobody playing it. No, but the drum kit, yeah, this guy's playing it. Yeah, you know? Or, we, yeah. or it's like you go to watch a Phil Collins tour, There's and you've got Chester, Chester Thompson, he's, he's playing most of the drums, and there's Phil Collins' kit. That doesn't get played all the time, but do you think anybody cares about that? It's part of the set, yeah. You know? I mean, there was a moment I uh, watched his one DVD, the finally the first farewell tour, yeah. where he did uh, his famous uh, in the air tonight. Yeah, comes around and everybody expects him to walk around, and he gets on his kit and he, and he yeah, drops in that, with that yeah. full, and he walked around and he got there, and he started walking, walked up the stairs again. Yeah, on the DVD, it's great. Everybody's like, oh, yeah. so he's going to do another circle. You know, he's got to come back. He's got, he's got, he's got to end up. On he's the got kit. to play the kit. Yeah. And he gets to the back of the set and he's up on the top and he's in the middle. And if you watch it on the kit, they, they had a, a drum kit come out of the ground. but quickly, Hydraulic, yeah. It literally, he took a step and then as his leg, some before his next step was on the drum kit. And wow. it literally just popped wow. up, he sat and played. It was like oh, the isn't crowd that mind boggling? Because it's like he's walking, there's no kit, no kit, no kit, no kit, kit sit. Yeah. You know? But Amazing. Been, all of his stuff has been like that. Yeah. No, but it's just, you know, it becomes part of the... No I love all, the, all the, the, the technology oh, with I mean, sets and all that. I mean, I mean it's the, unbelievable. The 19, uh, I watched uh, Cassiopeia Live in 1988. I, I got the DVD, uh, you know, the four guys. No vocals, jazz, 1988. Yeah. You know, and they had, yeah. like, they had squ square shapes and the, the sets are moving like this. You know, 60,000 people listening to jazz. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's crazy, yeah. but it's Amazing. all there. Yeah, look, I've enjoyed this chat. I think we're gonna we can sit here for the whole day, but we have to, oh, we gosh, have to we finish can. at some point. Absolutely, we can. Uh, I'd like to see us in South Africa get to a point whereby, i.e., um, England has, has, has Glastonbury Festival, it's mm -hmm. an every year thing. There's no reason why in South Africa we couldn't have a festival, it doesn't have to be for days and days. I mean, the Mandela gig pulled. Thousands and thousands, yeah. okay? Casper uh, filled Orlando Stadium or whatever it is, yeah. okay? There's no reason why we can't do that. We've just got to get our industry to a point where yeah, I mean, it people, runs People will say there's like lots of machine. festivals, but there's genre-based Yeah, festivals. and also, you know, I think at the end of the day, you cannot become or they put on a reputable festival of that sort but whereby by making it cheap and nasty. Mm. Not you know? true. I mean, I remember, and uh, um, our ex-friend who's passed away, Robbie Bailey. Mm. You remember the days when it was Yvonne Chaka Chaka yeah. and it was in those festivals in, so in soccer stadiums with terrible gear and terrible stuff and have 30,000 people and who would riot if, if one of the artists never arrived? Yeah. What's wrong with that? If we, that does, Days can all come back and everybody can do well and everybody will be working and we'll have an industry. Yeah, no, we're and just waiting for anything to happen at this, point, the, yeah. at this point in time. But the thing is this, yeah. okay, that it's disappeared because people became cheap and nasty. Mm. You know, it doesn't work. Yeah, look, I mean, from a, from a business perspective, I've, I've done gigs for free. No, where it's been a charity gig, there's been a yeah. cause, there's a cause yeah. behind it. You know, then I'd phone you and I'm saying, I, I'm not charging. Sure thing. You want to come to the party, jump in, we do a thing. 
But other things, you, you cost your things and you have your costs out there. If you get underquoted, that's one thing. But when you get under, yeah, yeah, underhanded, right. that's a different thing. You know, that, yeah. that's that's something that's. I think the education that needs to happen is is promoters need to understand that it's not a once, it's not a, a you're not going to get rich doing one gig. Yeah, you know. And I really, I would love to aspire to that in yeah. the future. Is have one thing, you know, annual thing. Every, where everybody's I mean, involved. the WOMAD festival is going to be coming back here for the three years, another three years, okay? Because they do three-year cycles. Mm. And this year, I hope, and this time, it's, I hope it's going to be really good, you know? Mm. Yeah. I think we've got to call it quits for now. Well, thank you so much. I would have put my hand watching. across the table, but I won't. I'll just yeah. knock on wood. <laughs> knock on wood. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, thanks for fantastic. joining. And, and again, thanks to everybody from, else from, who's from listening. From Sound yeah. GP's perspective, you know, our relationship has been amazing. I mean, and, I really yeah. value our, and we're going to go far on this. I mean, for we've sure. been working well together. Oh. And anybody out there, if you're looking for backline, fan it well. Give us a shout. Give Good Walks a shout. We'll put your contact details in the links. No problem. And if you guys need help with riders and, you know, or even wanting to know what's the difference between stuff, just chat you know we will we happily answer all your questions and us and we we, we as a background company we are here or we're in existence because of musicians mm. and more than anything any muser got any question about gear or how to do this or that please call yeah we would really love to do that and guys are welcome to you don't have to wait for a gig no if you want to see how the montage works total phone totally up. You know, like I've got like one console set up there and I've told a lot of guys, you know, just and I've had guys pitch up. They just want to come see it outside of the context. There's no totally. stress. Just fiddle on it, play on it. I mean, I I, um, I don't mind guys coming. I mean, mm. come to the house or, or we'll to, to the warehouse. We can set up a kit to play, mm. you know, jam. Come, you know, I don't know. We don't have a problem with that. You want to see how Fender Rhodes works? Come in. I'm busy working on them now. Awesome. You know, no problem. Yeah. You know. Cool, man. Thanks for joining us, guys. And we'll, we'll see you on the next episode. And yeah. we'll probably have another chat. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> cool. Cool.